central bank digital currencies. I am old enough to remember when those were still a bit of a conspiracy theory. And this is actually something that I've been talking out about for, for quite a while. Um, about well, two, three years ago, I sort of really got on the case and raised my public profile to push back against these. And the reason being is because I understood the technology and I understand also that the uh, government's propensity to uh, seize any new toolkit that offers them unlimited power is, is, is what they're going to, uh, is what they're going to leap to. Right. But before I tell you more about that, first of all, let's consider Premium Contemplations 90. What do the elite actually want? So this is you can find on our website. Our website, you can get full access to it for only £5 a month. You don't need to, uh, you don't even need to pay that to, to watch the full unedited podcast on the site. But if you want to go a bit deeper and get some of the, uh, the premium content, five pounds, a, £5 a month on the site, you'll find it there. Right. Back to the currencies. Um, so... I knew that even before sort of lockdowns, that this is something that the government were, were of course, going to be reaching to. Um, and we were told that, you know, don't worry, it's it's not something that we're going to be do. We're going to be sticking with cash, uh, not to be concerning. Um, but now this job has popped up. So this job on LinkedIn, head of central bank digital currencies, the Treasury, <laughs> um, so this, this is a conspiracy thing that's, that's currently in the hiring process. Now... Uh, it does worry me um, how they're going with this, although not that much because, um, as you can see, it's only 65 grand a year they're paying. So it's, it's, it's presumably they're not taking it that seriously at this point, but they're, they're, they're dipping their toe into the water. Lots of people sent me this job because actually I'm, I'm a fairly good fit for it. I, I, I could do this. I've, I've got some government and policy background um, and I understand the, the technology uh, as to how this make, makes this work. And I, I can see how it all fits in, into, the, into the big picture. So lots of people were telling me on Twitter that I should, um, I should apply for it. And, um, you know, maybe there's some merit in that. I could wear a GoPro and go in their um, Project Veritas style and, and see, what I, see what I dig up from the inside. Don't think I'm going to do that, um, mainly because I'm sort of on record um, calling the, uh, the person uh, who this reports into, Jeremy Hunt, as a bit of a, well, I'm, you know, I won't, I won't, I won't say it because uh, it's a family friendly you're not, show. <laughs> you're not the biggest fan. Not the biggest yeah. fan of of any of them, especially not uh, Mister Mister Hunt. Not uh, not anything else. Right. So yeah. No. The question I asked with central bank. I mean, how familiar are you with central bank digital currencies and what they can do? I'm not that familiar, which I think uh, makes this a good occasion for me to occupy the perspective yeah. of someone who doesn't know anything. So about, or knows very yeah, little about it, this, it, and it, yeah, it, it won't be difficult for me to occupy that perspective because it's the one that I. <laughs> so it's digitally um, native money. Yeah. I'm not actually necessarily against central bank digital currency currencies in their most vanilla form. The problem is, is they can get very scary when you add in the surveillance capabilities and you add in the programmability to them. Okay, so let me ask a question here because I am trying to understand this. Is it? Are you, do you think that something bad is going to happen or that it can happen and people in government will constantly say that yep. this is a way in which we could use power against So it the gives people. them a toolkit for ultimate power. Yeah. That's the scary thing about it because at any future point they can turn that on. So look, if I were to end up um, taking this job, what I would do is I'd end up designing them a, a central bank digital currency which was a bit similar to, to Bitcoin. I mean, I'd actually rather they just use Bitcoin, but I'd, yeah. I'd program them something similar to that that um, is is open, that anyone can access, anyone can send money to anybody. There's no surveillance. Um, even um, So, I mean, if... if um, if transactions are taking place, yes, you can see, you know, coins being moved around on the network, but yeah. you can't, but you're not necessarily tracking it at an individual level. So it's it's pseudonymous, it's not anonymous. So in the, let me see, in the Bitcoin, they can track the transaction, but they do not so tie they can this see with a, your a, physical a, 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 a location. A wallet with that number and a wallet with that number have exchanged. Yeah. Um, and if you wanted to do the work, you could link that back to an individual. But then there's other things that you can do with it. You can add a layer on top called the Lightning Network that does anonymise it, and that's almost yeah. certainly what would happen on that network. So it would effectively become far more anonymous than it is than it is even now. Um, but what central bank digital currencies can do is they can build in the capability um, of linking it with your digital ID. Okay. Now that's where it starts to get really scary because obviously a digital ID can become a social credit system. We've, I mean, we've already had a social credit system in this country. We had it for a short while. It was, you know, you couldn't go into nightclubs if you didn't have a, have a vaccine pass. Yeah. 
Um, so we've had a social credit system. It's just been a very simple one with one flag on it, vaccinated, yes or no. Uh, but you can add additional things onto that. The Chinese are doing this at this very moment. If you speak out against the government in a way they don't like, that goes on your social credit system. You might find your ability to buy plane tickets or train tickets. That gets withdrawn. You can't go into shopping centres. There are certain jobs you can't get. So is there, a, is there going to be a temptation to link it to um, digital IDs? Well, we've got this article here from the FT, um, yeah, that's the one. So th they were talking, and this this is this article is is now about two or three years old. Uh, they recognise fairly quickly that these central bank digital currencies are going to be linked to your digital ID. So if you if you do that and you and you surveil it, so you can see the transactions taking place, and it's linked to the ID, and then you add in programmability on top, you could end up with all sorts of nightmare scenarios. So you could say, you know. Um, that you've reached your spending limit on fuel yeah, or meat or eggs. I mean, if, I don't know why eggs suddenly... Will we be allowed to eat meat? Well, they, they could simply withdraw it. They, I mean, yeah. they could start off by saying, you know, you're only allowed, um, I don't know, 200 grams a week or something like that, and then they will they will reduce it down. And because, yeah. the, because it's linked to your ID, so they're keeping track of you, and the money is programmable, you know, even if you go to the, even if you go to the counter and you try and pay, the payment will get rejected. And so the shopkeeper will just say, I'm sorry, we're going to have to take the, take the meat out of the chopping basket before we can process a transaction. Yeah. So they can do, and they can do that with fuel, uh, and they can do it for the green agenda, they can do all sorts of stuff. Now, the thing that particularly concerns me about this is you know i did a, a segment on 15 minute cities um uh, a week or two ago and there we are seeing that it is the case right now but they are trying to push us into districts within cities yeah. now at the moment it's just oxford and canterbury but it's almost certainly going to be a whole bunch more cities coming through so we know that the uh the global elite they want to push us into cities and then once they're there, they want us to keep us in certain districts. They want to stop us from, from exiting that. And at the moment, they're willing to use cameras and barriers to ensure that we don't leave in our cars any more than 100 times a year. Do you think that they want to do this so it's easier to track movement? What What are the reasons why you think it would be good? Well, the reasons they give why is would because they they're, they're helping us. Because by creating a, a city where every, everything in 15 minutes you know, is less stress and you'll be happier. So it's better for you. I, I think the real reason is because they're concerned about people pushing back. If yeah. you look at what the World Economic Forum is saying, every year there's a lot of conversation, a lot of discussion about how the world is going to become angrier, yeah. about how people are going to rise up against the government, how people are not trusting institutions anymore. To my mind, when people get angrier, it's better to leave some space between them. So why would they well, maybe bring stop, them together? Maybe stop doing the thing that's making them angry. But, yeah. so, so, I mean, I just ask this. If they, if they have demonstrated that they want to push us into 15-minute cities and they demonstrated that they're willing to use cameras and barriers to achieve keeping us within those districts, why should we think that they wouldn't use the programmability of central bank digital currencies to also achieve that objective? Because, I mean, if, if they've decided it is a good thing, why would you not use all of the tools at your disposal to achieve that? So it could become as simple as if you you're, you are given a district... Um, the, the portion of the city you live in or maybe the town and you're only allowed to leave it 100 times a year or maybe it starts off at 100 times a year and if you do leave it more often than that your money won't work you know you go to shops to buy some lunch on your day trip away and it, and the payment is declined so they say you, you're not going to use your car you can only use your bicycle or you have emitted a particular amount of yeah, CO2 I mean, I, I guess so in that scenario, stay you, home. You would, you'd have to fill up your petrol tank before, if you're yeah. assuming you're still allowed cars at that point. You have yeah, to yeah. fill up a lunchbox and off you go, and you need to not spend anything until you come back. Uh, now, now with these 15-minute cities, it's already the case that it's, you know, you're only allowed to leave a, a hundred times um, a year in your car, and that's obviously going to, I say, go to, go to other cities and also go down from 100 days. I mean, it will be, you know, 50 days and then 20 and then 10 and then, I don't know, maybe maybe zero after a point that you're, that you're not allowed to leave. I can see an egalitarian argument. Of course, I don't embrace it. That, uh, you know, some, some people are not uh, going out much. So mm. why should you want to go out much? Stay inside. Yeah, exactly. And that is that that was the um, original original logic for the 15 minute cities. You know, they said, well, we noticed that people are sticking very close to the home. The yeah. data set they were using was during the pandemic when basically you got arrested if you went more than five minutes from your home. So so yeah. that that data was was helpful for them. Now, Rishi Sunak, um, when this first started getting talked about, put up an article on LinkedIn 
in which he explained the way that they're looking at central bank digital currencies. And he was very keen to explain that they're not going to try and use this as a replacement for cash, which is odd because the World Economic Forum were already publishing papers at this point saying that it was exactly that, that it was going to be a replacement for cash. May I say something here? I don't understand this statement. It seems to me to be entirely sophistical because even if that were true for him, and he would not going he was not going to use it against people it's a toolkit as you said mm. that makes it easier for future leaders to yes, do this precisely so what does this statement even mean as if well, pa- power does not end with <laughs> rishi sunak yeah, I mean, I, I, I think he's trying to calm the horses, effectively what he's doing yeah. here. So he put up this article on LinkedIn, and this was near the start of the pandemic that he published this, saying, you know, don't worry, we're not going to use it to replace cash and um, take away anonymity and all the rest of those things. I'm not sure why I can't find this article on LinkedIn anymore. I had to go to the Wayback When machine to find it. So, I mean, maybe this is just me not you know, using the, the, the tools properly, but uh, I, I couldn't find it. That, that seems Maybe to be removed he, now. Maybe he got fined with not wearing a seatbelt and they told them that you are not allowed to post stuff. <laughs> in... Quite possible. Yeah. But can I find any suggestion that possibly there is going to be a, a serious pushback against cash? Well, another thing that I noticed about the same time as, as Rishi Sonic was putting this up, towards the beginning of the pandemic, I don't know if you remember, but but I definitely picked up on this, very early on in the lockdown period, I suddenly started hearing a lot of messaging about a cashless society. And it was just weird. It came out of nowhere. I mean, it had clearly been fed to a whole bunch of journalists because it was just like on a dime, one day, all of a sudden, these journalists start talking about, you know, we're going to be, need to move towards this cashless society. And it's like, well, how does that fit into the, the news flow? How, yeah. how, how does that relate to anything? So it is clearly a line that had been pushed on them, but they were trying to get out at the time. So there was an agenda coming from somewhere to try and get people to start moving away from cash. And obviously that's had some results because now I'm starting to go into um, well, restaurants all the time now and seeing a sign up that says, you know, we, we don't take cash, something like that. Yeah. Starbucks do it. I mean, a, a whole bunch of, of other places, they, they sort of do this. You know, we're not, we're not taking cash anymore. So and, and actually, there was something interesting that um, I picked up on towards the end of the pandemic. And this was the resignation speech of Allegra Stratton. So Allegra Stratton, Stratton was, I think, the communications chief for, for Boris Johnson. And if you remember, they had all these absurd lockdown restrictions that um, I made a point of breaking as often as possible because, you know, I don't grant government the right to tell me what I can and can't do. So so I made a point of breaking them. But, but Downing Street also uh, made a point of breaking them as often as they could and having parties. And actually, they did a much better job than I did of, of partying it up over the lockdown period. She made light of this, and so she forced to resign. And so she comes out of her home, and she gives this um, tearful speech about um, you know how she's proud of the work that she's done, and she's sorry for all that kind of stuff. But she said an interesting thing in the middle of this. So let's play this little clip and see if you pick up on the same thing that I pick up on. I will always be proud of what was achieved at COP26 in Glasgow and the progress that was made on coal cars, cash and trees. This country and the Prime Minister's leadership on climate change and on nature will make a lasting difference to the whole world. So did you catch that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's talking about, she talks about cash as well. Yeah. Coal, Coal, cars and cash. Yeah. What exactly does she mean by the progress that they made on coal, cars and and cash so the only one of those that i could find any explicit mention to was coal because they because downing street were also at this time they were putting out a whole bunch of videos of um life inside um downing street and what we're working on stuff like that and they had this whole interesting video which was relating to cop 26 which he's just referred to there and one of the things they explicit and they even did an infographic for it was how we are working to eradicate coal yeah now um Fair enough. I mean, obviously that didn't last long because um, then they started sanctioning Russia and now we're having to buy Russian energy only after the Indians have have put a mark up on it, um, you know, after they've done their arbitrage. So um, energy prices in Europe are very very high and we're having to go back to coal in a massive way. So that didn't work, but clearly the agenda was to get rid of coal. What about about the agenda on cars and cash? Well, um, cars could be referring 
it's possibly the um, strategy to go for electrification by 2030. That could be what she's referring to. Or maybe that is uh, in relation to the 15-minute cities. Because, again, I find it so weird. And, and ever since I did that 15-minute um, city segment, I've just had it in my head. Why is it that no national politician is speaking out against this? It's like they're, they're, they're just very happy to ha see it roll out. Now, I'm not going to allege collusion at every level, but it looks a lot like collusion. Do you think that they view it as a sort of hot potato? They think it is inevitable and they just yeah. uh, want to say, l uh, we're not going to talk about it, at least explicitly. Just uh, let the local councils do it. Yeah, let the local councils do it. And mm. if, you know, they may also hope, some of them who may not be happy with it, maybe they will think that, you know, it, let the other people do it. I can't believe that we're rolling so out... So we don't get the political yeah, I cost. Can't, I can't believe that we're rolling out the segregation of communities in this country and no national politician has an opinion on it. So anyway, that's just what she could be referring to on cars. What about cash? I want to ask you something here because, yeah. you know, it's good to have an economist's perspective. So to my mind, we are moving away from cash for a long time now because we use credit cards and debit cards. But it seems to me that there's a difference between credit cards and um, debit cards and central bank digital currency, oh, yeah. the way you... So what is it? I, I want to understand what, what this so, is. So um, even if you're using credit cards, yes, that transaction is monitored and it's surveilled and all that kind of stuff. And, you're, and, the, and the card issuer, they see what you're spending your money on. Um, but... Even our current financial system it is quite fragmented. There's a whole load of different banks and a whole load of different payment networks. So let's say the government decides it wants to know what you've been spending your money on. It, at the moment, it needs to do an individual court order to every bank to say, you know, we think Stelios is up to something. You know, let's see his records. It's much harder for them to, to go after it on that level. With a central bank digital currency, there, I mean, all the information, it just all feeds directly back to the central bank straight away. So the moment it takes place, they will know... Um, what it is that you've spent your money on? So we have a very, we have much easier profiling. It gives uh, the attempt. It, it, it the, gives an incredible surveillance the opportunity tool to, to the those government, in power, especially when to... you link it with the digital ID. Um, and and then of course that digital ID it can be required to be linked to your smartphone. Yeah. Um, you might find that for your safety, the government requires that your um, location on your phone is turned on at all times. Yeah. So they will know where you are at all times. Um, they will know what. Every every item of spending, what you know, whatever occurs, um, and if they want to apply restrictions. Now, what, as you quite rightly said, even if Rishi Sunak has the um, very best of intentions, as I'm sure he does, what if what about some future prime minister? It's a hot potato. Yeah, yeah. They they could simply decide. Actually, no, we do want the ability yeah. to to limit um, your fuel purchases or your meat purchases or leaving your leaving your town or district of your of your city for you know more than ten days a year or more than one day a year, whatever they they want to make it at some future point. It gives them that toolkit. So uh, no, I won't be applying um, for this job. Um, I mean, especially after I'm on record as being so critical of them. Maybe though, you could be a good fit for the role, not to push the agenda because with great. Power Power comes great responsibility <laughs> and you know if if your heart is pure that, maybe you that, that's why i'm optimistic because i mean they're they're not actually paying an awful lot for this job it makes me think that they don't quite understand the power of what it is that they could be creating so uh, the the formation of a new currency is a really powerful tool if you did it right because we're we're at the point in the world at the moment where the world is crying out for an alternative to the dollar People are increase, increasingly, they're trusting the dollar less. It's causing problems for smaller nations like Sri Lanka when there's a dollar shortage. If there was an alternative to the dollar that had a high trust, that could be very powerful. That could be widely adopted. And if you put it into something like a central bank digital currency and you used inflation the right way, which is you acknowledge it's a tax and you basically just you know apply a 2% interest rate every year and you use that to directly fund the government, you could have foreign nations all around the world adopting yeah. this as their secondary currency and then effectively paying tax back to the UK. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of things that you could do with it. The fact that they're not really taking it seriously makes me think they don't quite understand what they've got here. Um, however, having said that, 
I don't think there's any serious possibility of the UK wanting to sort of dethrone the dollar, or at least become a serious rival in any way. Uh, because, uh, and and I, I say this only slightly in jest, in jest. If if we were to ever really challenge the dollar, I think they would bomb us. Seriously, and I didn't. I didn't used to think that a few years ago. I don't think the the US had turned on us. But if if anyone threatens the dollar, um, you know they go for you hard. I mean, look at what they did with Germany. You know, over the last year, they've basically forced them to deindustrialize and cripple themselves as an economy. Um, and they they went after the euro through various mechanisms. <laughs> May I ask, do you think that they're giving uh, 60K? Or do you think that that's a sign that they're not interested in who they hire? I, I think it's a sign that the solution isn't really being developed by the Treasury. Is it being developed by AI? <laughs> Quite possibly. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content we have on the site, such as the premium articles, this one on the anatomy of the communist, with an audio track for silver and gold tier members, of course. If you'd like to find out what else we're putting out, you can follow us on Getter at lotuseaters underscore com on Getter. Thank you and goodbye. Mm -hmm.